My name is Gary Johnson. I'm good to, glad to be here with you this morning at 8th Street. I preach at the local church over in Gilbert on the Greenfield Road, Church of Christ. I uh, want to talk to you this morning about wearing the name Christian. We sometimes always are familiar with the song, Amazing Grace. I want you to think about some of the words in that song as we begin this morning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Now let me stop there for a second because I want people to pay attention to the words that we sing so often that mean so much to us, such as that song. In Psalm 119 and verse 18, the psalmist said, Open my eyes that I might see wondrous things from your law. The very nature of singing about amazing grace, the fact that God sent His only begotten Son to die for mankind in the wretchedness of their sins is wonderful. But then that same song says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear," talking about the proper respect for God. That absolute element of fear like we would of a father, even God our Father. And grace my fears allayed. Why? Because I've submitted myself to the teaching associated with grace. So we begin to talk about the greatest story ever told from Genesis to Revelation revealing unto us the story of how God in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 4, when the fullness of time was come, He sent forth His Son to be Savior of mankind. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21. By the way, I'm reading out of the American Standard Version in the New Testament. In Matthew 1 and verse 21, the angel Gabriel came to a virgin named Mary. And he said these words there, You are going to have a son conceived by the Holy Spirit, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Why name Jesus? For it is he that will save his people from their sins. Such a glorious thing that we see unfolding through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel that tell about his life, tell about his death, his burial, his resurrection. And we come to the conclusion of Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 2 when he says, Let all the house of Israel therefore know assuredly that God hath made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified by the hands of lawless men. Now the people on that day, the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, responded to Peter's sermon by saying, men and brethren, what must we do? We killed the Christ, the very Savior that God sent for us. And he said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, that name for the remission of your sins, for the promises to you and to your children and to all them that are far off, down through verse 39. And then he says in verse 42 that some 3,000 plus souls were saved that day and they continued steadfastly in the teachings of the apostles, the breaking of bread and prayers. We see that commitment being made in reference to that greatest story ever told. For it was Jesus who came to say, seek and save the lost, Luke 19 and verse 10. When we turn over to the book of Acts again, but this time in chapter 4, we read in verse 12 and following these simple words that impress upon us the importance of saying, Hey, I'm a Christian. I wear the name of Christ, the one who died for me. Chapter 4 and verse 10, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that in the name of Jesus the Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even in him does this man stand here made whole. Such an important thing that we begin to recognize that there is no other name under heaven whereby we must be saved. Because it says in verse 12, In none other is there salvation. For neither is there any other name under heaven wherein um, given among men wherein we must be saved. So how is important it is it that we tell this story, the greatest story ever told. And we recognize that this great story... This element of great news that God cared about mankind who had turned their back on him in sin. And we find out that he calls us by the gospel. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14 says that. But then we need to ask the question in reference to acknowledging what the word gospel means. Simply good news. The good news that God made available to mankind salvation in his only begotten son.
We recognize that when we read from the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans in chapter 1, where Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For therein is revealed a righteousness of God from faith unto faith. But the righteous shall live by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We study through these things and we begin to realize that those of us who have obeyed the gospel... We're mindful that in 1 Peter chapter 2, that is the Apostle Peter writing to those who have already obeyed the gospel. And he says these words, God called us out of sin, darkness, into his marvelous light. The concept of light dealing with righteousness and purity. And we see in 1 John chapter 3, such a marvelous statement. Verses 1 through 3 in part says, Behold what manner of love the fathers bestowed upon us that we should be called what? Children of God. And everyone that has this hope in himself purifies himself. In other words, works toward righteousness, not sin any longer. So as we discuss these things about wearing the name of Christ, the importance of such a name, the greatest story ever told, let us be mindful that God was the one who spoke from heaven in Matthew chapter 17 and verse 5 and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. And then we're mindful of Hebrew writer by inspiration in chapter 1 and 1 through 3 telling us that God spoke to men in time past by dreams and by other men, prophets and other means. But now in this day and age, the Christian age, he speaks to us in His Son. How important it is for acknowledge that. And so the question is, are we listening to Jesus? Have you obeyed that gospel, that good news? And so we study things such as John chapter 8 and verse 24. We're listening to Jesus. We hear Him say, except you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. It's not just saying the words, I believe, though, because Jesus is the one who said in Luke 13, and verse 3, I say unto you, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Perish how? Perish in sin. Separated God from a God for eternity. Acknowledging those things, we hear Jesus say these words in Matthew chapter 10. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who's in heaven. If you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father in heaven. And how Many of us are very much aware of it. it was Jesus that said in Mark 16, 16, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that disbelieveth shall be condemned. Over and over again, we see how these teachings are so plain in reference to the plan of salvation that man needs to obey the gospel and not be ashamed of it. But that wasn't all. Jesus said in that great commission, this time in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you unto the end of the age, the Christian age. Dear friend, have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Do you claim to be a Christian? Are you claiming to wear that name, that name that is above every name? If so, then you're a disciple. A disciple is a learner. It is a follower. And so we hear the words of Jesus again, but this time in Matthew 16 and verse 24, when it is Jesus who said, If any man is willing, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and yes, follow me. And so wearing the name of Christ is not just saying I'm a Christian. It's not just saying I believe. It's the idea of repentance, which is a change of mind that results in a change of action. That is, I wasn't following Christ, now I am a willing follower of Christ. Not my will be done, but the will of God in heaven. And so we see those things as we unfold the simple passages of Scripture. And being a follower, I make a commitment, a decision to follow Him. I'm mindful that the Scriptures say in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman 
that needs not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Or we see in such a passage as 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, and we're back to the concept of grace for a minute. Because Peter said to those Christians, but grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And by the way, that's a command, it's an imperative statement in that passage. And so when we study 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 9 and verse 6 there, where it talks about the idea of walking by faith and not by sight, again, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. I want you to hold on to that. He says, therefore, we make it our aim to be well-pleasing unto Him, whether I'm alive in this life or I passed on to the next life. My intention is to please Him who gave me the Christ, the good news that I can be saved from my sins. So we study those things, and again, we are mindful of Acts chapter 2, that the disciples who were following and committed themselves to be followers continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and the breaking of bread and prayers. We try and put these things together in such harmony that we study such things as Ephesians chapter 2. I won't spend time to reading verses 1 through 10, but you can certainly read it later. Listen to how it begins. And you did he make alive. When did God make us alive? When we obeyed the gospel, and we'll see that in just a second. When you were dead through your trespasses and sins, wherein you used to walk according to the course of this world, according to the prince of powers of the air and the spirit, and now worketh in the sons of not obedience, but disobedience. He says in verse 5, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. You see, in baptism, we put on Christ, Galatians chapter 3 and verses 26 and 27. For it is by grace that you've been saved. The very nature of that sweet sound that we sing about. Open my eyes that I might see wondrous things from your law. Raised up together with him and made to sit with him in heavenly places. The very nature of our spiritual conquest over sin. To be with Christ, with him, both now and in the life to come. It says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God afore prepared that we should walk in. Not meritorious works, but the idea of those things that are commanded by God. That me making a commitment to Him as He made a commitment to me to die for me. That I would in fact live for Him according to His works. The things that He's prepared for me to do. We're still talking about grace, aren't we? How sweet the sound. And so I study passages like Titus chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12. Listen carefully about grace and how important it is. Many people make the mistake of stopping at verse 11. Verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. And when you stop there, you can have the belief in your mind and you can deceive yourself that everybody gets to go to heaven. But that's not true. It says concerning the grace of God that has been brought to mankind, it says in verse 12, it instructs us to this intent of the heart, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly where? In this present world, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then in verse 14, with that attitude in mind, it says being zealous, really caring, dedicated to the idea of good works, a foreprepared God, God that we should walk in them. Now follow with me a little bit. You've heard many people talk from time to time about the idea of being born again. It's a favorite phrase of many who want to believe that God's grace allows everybody to go to heaven. They just say the words, I believe, and therefore they're saved. Well, wait a minute. Let's look at three passages as we look through the scripture this morning about being born again, most people return to John chapter 3 where Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in verses 3 through 5. And Jesus said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto thee, Nicodemus, except one be born anew. Now, sometimes follow the footnotes in your Bible. It says, except someone be born from above. Except someone be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Jesus said, Truly I'm saying unto you, except one be born of water and the Spirit. The Spirit's teaching. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. When we begin to understand that Jesus wasn't talking about physical things, 
going back into your mother's womb. Well, that's silly. Jesus was talking about the idea of being dead in sin, listening to the teachings of God in Jesus Christ, and in the process of that, repenting of their sins and being born again. Let's see if that harmonizes with the scriptures concerning being born again. And although the words are not used specifically in Romans chapter 6, I want you to go there with me. And I want to begin reading in verse 3 of Romans chapter 6 because this expresses the very idea of being dead and being born again, dead to sin and raised to walk in a new life in service to God in righteousness. Follow with me. And guess what it says in verse 3? It says, Don't be ignorant that all we who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. One of the questions I like to ask people all the time, where did you come in contact with the death of Jesus? You see, it's the death of Jesus that allows us in his sinless life, having died for mankind, to in fact have opportunity for salvation. Verse 3 acknowledges to us that we were baptized into his death. Now watch how this follows along. We were buried, therefore, with him through baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. Now watch how he explains this. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, how? We were buried in the waters of baptism. With him we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, coming up out of the water. We see that in many scriptures concerning baptism. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. You see the concept of death being taught here? Our old man of sin was crucified, that is the body of sin, should be done away in baptism. That we should no longer be enslaved to sin. For he that has died is justified for sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died once unto sin, but the life he lives, he lives unto God. Now listen to the conclusion of this section of the passage. Even so, reckon yourselves to be dead unto sin but alive unto God. The fellow, the gal who wears the name of Christ, the fellow or the gal who obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ, dedicates himself, herself, in the direction of saying, I don't want to sin anymore. I am going to grow in the grace and knowledge. I am going to do those things that are pleasing unto God that he teaches me to live soberly and righteously in this present world. And then watch where we go with this for a second in verses 12 through 14, because the explanation is even given further for us. Let not sin therefore rule in your mortal body. Don't obey sin. That you should obey the lust thereof, neither present the members of your body, your physical body, unto sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather present yourselves unto God as alive from the dead, and your members of your body as instruments of righteousness. Why? For sin having been crucified with Christ, shall no longer rule over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. So wearing the name of Christ, the greatest name, is such an important thing. And I want you to see that there's one other passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. Now remember that Peter is writing to Christians. And beginning in verse 18, Knowing that you were redeemed not with corruptible things, with silver and gold from your vain manner of life handed down from your fathers, but you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb without blemish, without spot, even the blood of Christ, who was foreknown indeed before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest at the end of times for your sake, who through him are believers in God that raised him from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and your hope might be in God. Now watch where he goes with this in the next couple of verses. Writing again to those who have already obeyed the gospel. Seeing that you have purified your souls in your obedience to the truth unto unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another from the heart fervently, having been what? Having been begotten again. That's past tense. Not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. How was I begotten again? Born from above, born from the Word of God or through the Word of God. I listened to what God said through His Son. I believed, I repented, I confessed. 
and I was baptized for the remission of sins, and I was raised to walk in a new life in service to God, where wearing the name of Christ is something precious to me. And therefore, because He died for me, I live for Him. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. In verses 20 and 21, and I really want you to be very, very much mindful of the fact that has, as we've studied through some passages this morning, we've been talking about grace that saves. We've been talking about faith that is obedient. And we're talking about the idea of serving God His way according to the works that He afore prepared that I should walk in, staying away from sin and pursuing righteousness and growing thereby. Listen to Galatians 2 and verse 20. Paul writes and says, I've been crucified with Christ. When was He crucified with Christ? When He was baptized. You remember the story of the conversion of Saul? That is, Paul in Acts chapter 9 and 22 and 26 of the book of Acts. Read that sometime. I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says. It is no longer I that live, but rather Christ now lives in me. And the life which I now live in this flesh, I live in faith, the faith which is in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now watch verse 21. In verse 21 he says, I do not make void the grace of God. For if righteousness is through the law, speaking of the law of Moses, then Jesus died for naught. My only way of being righteous before God, that is without sin, is the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. And so we study a passage in harmony with what we're talking about, Galatians chapter 2. And we look in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verses 19 and 20. And he says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. That's what we just read about in 1 Peter chapter 1, in verses 18 and 19. Therefore, glorify God in your body. And as we draw things toward a close this morning with our time, let us consider the idea of simple passages that just go in harmony with what we've said so far. The idea of faith working through love. That's in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6. Or what about the simple passage in James chapter 1 that says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. You see, it's not just hearing what Jesus did for us. It's being doers of the things that we've committed ourselves to in following Him in the direction of righteousness, not sin. That's why it's so easy to see in James chapter 2 and verses 14 through 24 where James uses the illustration of how Abraham walked by faith obediently doing the things that God said, thereby working what God wanted him to do. Or Rahab, remember Rahab the harlot in Jericho? Yes, sinners, wretched sinners like harlots can obey the gospel and serve God. In James chapter 2, and verses 24 through 26, the only place where faith and only are used in the same passage, James writes and says, you see that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Are we listening to the harmony of those passages? Now let me take you to a wonderful passage that's in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 7 through 12. Philippians was just a wonderful church apparently in service to God. And Paul writes these words beginning in verse 7. Speaking about himself, he says, How be it what things were gained to me in this life, these have I counted loss for Christ. Yea, verily I count all things to be lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I suffer the loss of all things and do count them but refuge, that I might gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own. That would be meritorious works even that which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. In other words, doing the things that God planned for me to do. The righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him, the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His Spirit, His sufferings, becoming conformed unto His death, if by any means I may attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained, Paul says, or am already made complete or perfect, but I press on, if so be, I may lay hold on that for which I was laid hold on by Jesus Christ. Verse 14, I press on toward the goal under the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. 
My oh my, what a wonderful story it is. The greatest story ever told concerning our love for the Lord. Now listen carefully. As we conclude this morning, let me bid you, if you say that you love God, John chapter 14, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And it was Jesus who said, why would you call me Lord, Lord, and then not do the things I say? Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 27, there's a simple story taught where Jesus said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. And in the process of that, he tells the story about the wise man who built his house on the rock versus the foolish man who built his house on the sand. Listen to me carefully. It is the wise man who hears the words of Jesus and does them. Now let me conclude with this thought. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 5 through 8, we find out that Jesus is the rock, is the cornerstone of our faith. And he says in those passages that those of us who will simply believe and obey that Jesus is that solid rock. But he says in reference to those who would disobey him, Jesus has become a stumbling block. So let me say this as we end this morning. Are you wearing the name of Christ today? Why don't you make it your aim? Make it my aim to serve the Lord. Won't you let your light shine today?